since October 7th a year ago, Israel has achieved most of its strategic objectives when it comes to Gaza, all with the idea of making sure that October 7th could never happen again. In the space of a year, it's managed to dismantle Hamas's military capacity. It's destroyed much of its arsenal. It's eliminated its senior leadership, including most recently Yahya Sinwar. This has come at the cost, great cost, to Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Now is the time to turn those successes into an enduring strategic success. And there are really two things left to do. Get the hostages home and bring the war to an end with an understanding of what will follow. And that's what we've been working on uh, this past day and will continue to work on throughout this trip. When it comes to the hostages, I met again with hostage families last night, including the families of the seven Americans who remain in Gaza. And that reinforces once again for me and for all of us the urgency, the imperative of bringing them home, bringing all of them home. We talked about the plan that we've had on the table and the work that we're doing on that plan, looking at new frameworks and formulations as a possibility. Uh, we talked about the importance of determining whether Hamas is prepared to engage in moving forward. And the Egyptians, the Qataris, are doing just that. But I believe that with Sinwar gone, because he was the primary obstacle to realizing a hostage agreement, there is a real opportunity to bring them home and to accomplish the objective. With regard to what follows in Gaza, this is critical because we have to end the war in a way that keeps Hamas out, make sure that Israel doesn't stay, and Israel does not want to stay. But we have to have clear, concrete plans for what follows. So we're spending a lot of time focused on that question, talking not only to uh, Israelis, but talking to many Arab partners. We've had these conversations for some time. I'll be pursuing them in the days ahead uh, as we meet with Arab partners, both here uh, and in Europe. And we're working to get clear understandings for Gaza's governance, for its security, for its reconstruction, and what the international community can do to help and help Palestinians rebuild uh, their lives. Even as all of this is happening, it's absolutely essential that humanitarian assistance get to the people who need it in Gaza. And as you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Austin and I wrote to the Defense Minister, Strategic Affairs Minister, uh, with a list of things that need to happen in order for assistance to get more effectively to people who need that assistance. So we went over that in some detail yesterday, uh, and I, I can report that there's progress made which is good, but more progress needs to be made. And most critically, it needs to be sustained. We've had periods before where the Israelis have increased what they're doing only to see it fall back. So we're tracking this very, very, very carefully, and we went over it in some detail. Finally, even as we're dealing with Gaza, with the hostages, with the humanitarian situation, it's also been an imperative for us to try to make sure that this conflict doesn't spread. We are resolute in our defense of Israel when it comes to attacks it's receiving from Iran, from Iran's proxies. And we stand with Israel and will always stand with Israel in its defense. It's also very important that Israel respond in ways that do not create greater escalation and do not risk spreading the conflict. With Hezbollah and Lebanon, uh, we're working intensely uh, to reach agreements on the effective implementation of 1701, the UN Security Council resolution that many years ago should have avoided what we're seeing now, but didn't because it's never been implemented. Uh, it's absolutely critical that the parties, and notably Hezbollah, be moved back from the border, that the Lebanese armed forces are able to assume their responsibilities, um, and that we can create an environment in which people on both sides of the border can return to their homes in peace and security. That's what we're driving at. Spent a lot of time on that as well. My colleague Amos Hochstein was in Lebanon at the same time. And this is what we're driving toward, a peaceful diplomatic resolution, which is the only enduring way to make sure that there is peace and stability across the border and people can get on with their lives. Let me stop there and take any questions. Andrew? Andrew. Secretary, good morning. You said that there has been progress. I want to ask you about the humanitarian crisis in North Gaza. Independent 
Experts like Cindy McCain of the World Food Program say it is a disaster that children are malnourished with lifelong health effects, those who are not already starving. Uh, the population is being decimated. The attacks continue, contrary to what you said about Israel having accomplished its initial goals. And according to these experts, Israel is blocking aid from getting in with unreasonable searches at the border and other obstacles so that the food is not getting to the people who desperately need it. You said there's been progress. What evidence do you have of that? And what more still needs to be done? So, Andrea, this is exactly why uh, we're so intensely focused on this issue. It's why Secretary in Austin and I wrote uh, to our counterparts here in Israel. It's why we insisted that they take concrete, specific actions to improve the situation, to enable food not only to get to Gaza, and there are trucks getting to Gaza, a big part of the challenge is once they're there, it's moving them around within Gaza. There are a lot of challenges that go along with that, including lawlessness, including looting, but Israel has to maximize everything it has under its control in order to get the food in. Since that letter, yes, we've seen progress, but it's not enough. We've seen progress in the opening of the Erez crossing. We've seen progress in the reanimation of the Jordanian corridor. Uh, we've seen progress in the opening of a fifth crossing point. Um, and other steps that are being taken. We have a list of things that we're going through one by one, systematically, with our Israeli counterparts to make sure that they follow through. And we told them very clearly in the letter that we expected these steps to be taken within 30 days, but starting immediately. They have started, uh, and we're tracking this, as I say, every single day. We have uh, senior officials from the department whose job is to focus on that every day. That's exactly what they're doing. The measure, though, is are people getting what they need. That's what we're looking at, and it has to be done in a sustained way. Back in April, I wrote a similar letter, exactly. uh, and at that point, the letter didn't become public. This one did, but we saw the improvements in April, and then we saw it go on a downward trajectory again. That's what caused Secretary Austin and I to write again. That's what's causing us right now to have this intense focus, even as we're trying to get to an end of conflict in Gaza, bring the hostages home, even as we're dealing with Lebanon, even as we're dealing with Iran. I mean, you, in April you warned them. Why wasn't that warning enough once they backslid? Because we saw we saw them take action, we saw concrete improvements, and then, as we saw is it, it abate again... Is it to withhold the weapons as is I, congressionally mandated? I am law. determined to follow the law. I will follow the law. Uh, uh, Mr. Secretary, you came to Israel to meet Netanyahu while his own ministers are holding a conference on the border of Gaza about reestablishing settlements there and extending and deepening Israel's occupation. Uh, did you raise this with Netanyahu? And uh, secondly, we're headed to Saudi Arabia next, where you've been working on a deal to enter a permanent defense pact with the Saudis. Do you think that's the message voters want to hear, that now is the time to further commit American lives and treasure in the Middle East? So, John, I think you're referring to the so-called general's plan. Am I, am I correct? These are retired generals? who have proposed But also the reoccupying Gaza, Gaza yeah. settlers were, were meeting and ministers of Netanyahu's own government were saying, let's, let's resettle Gaza. Yeah. Well, uh, I can be very clear on that because I've been clear on that for the last year. We fully reject it. We reject any Israeli reoccupation of Gaza. I said so in Tokyo a year ago. It's been U.S. policy. It will remain U.S. policy. And it's also, to the best of my understanding, the policy of the Israeli government. That's what I heard from, uh, from the prime minister who is the authoritative word on these things. So whatever they say, whether it's retired generals or some members of the government, uh, that is not the policy of the government, and it is certainly not the policy of the United States. We reject it. Right now, the focus needs to be on getting the hostages home, ending this war, and having a clear plan for what follows. That's been the focus of our conversations. That's going to be the focus of the conversations going forward. With Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is a critical player in virtually all of uh, these issues, uh, whether it's potentially Gaza and uh, plans for what follows uh, the end of the war, uh, whether it's uh, in Lebanon, uh, whether it's dealing with the challenges posed by Iran, we'll be talking about all of that. But more broadly, there remains, despite everything that's happened, an incredible opportunity in this region to move in a totally different direction, one that actually provides in a durable way for Israel's security, for its place in the region, a country that's integrated, working with its Arab partners, accepted by them, isolating Iran and those who are trying uh, to disrupt and destroy people's lives. You've got an axis of resistance on the one hand. You can see 
a partnership for peaceful coexistence. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia would be right at the heart of that, and that includes potentially normalization of relations with Israel. That remains a, an issue that's, uh, that's real, uh, that's possible, and that we're going to be talking about as we have over uh, these many months. But one of the things that's so important is we're dealing with the, the day in, day out, and the incredible challenges that each of these uh, different areas poses is also to keep your eyes on the strategic prize, to keep the focus on where this can go in a positive way, just as we know where it can go in a very negative way, and to continue to work to get on that positive trajectory, because that's clearly what's going to be in the interests of people throughout the region, including people here in Israel. The vast majority of people want a secure life. They want a prosperous life. They want some opportunity. They want to be able to go about their daily lives in a normal way. Uh, that's what's driving people. And I can see uh, a future where we can realize those ambitions for people. Uh, so we have to keep the focus there, even as we're dealing with these acute challenges in the moment. And you think Thanks Netanyahu had his word that he's not going to resettle Gaza, that he's not going to let his right-wing cabinet uh, move in and reoccupy? All I can tell you is that is the stated policy of the, of the government of Israel, and it is definitely the stated policy of the government of the United States, and one we will insist on. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yep.